in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. I plead with you to promote respect for all of God's children. So that's what we're hope, here hoping to encourage you to do. And the second reason we feel compelled and energized to do it is that we owe it to our children and other children of, of color. I went to an event recently with my youngest uh, child, and he's normally very talkative, and on the way home, he was just silent. And I said to him, Isaac, what do you think? And he said, I think it's a bad time to be black. And so that's why we want to, want to talk about this today. So, and so one let's thing, just... If I may, yeah. um, what we're really encouraged by also is the work that we're doing together um, around the valley, and then also some of the work we're doing in our in Parley Stake. We have what we call a leading out committee. So we're tying back our sort of anti-prejudice work back to the prophet's call. But we really, really feel um, supported by members who feel like the conversations kind of out in the world are vitriolic. They are angry, they are divisive, and um, when you can do it in a gospel context, you can feel the Savior's love, and you can work together to be more and more like a, a Zion people. And so we're glad to be here where we're, you know, heeding the prophet's call, trying to be disciples of Christ and stand as his witness um, in what we do. And so we think that this is a great place to have these kinds of hard discussions sometimes. Okay, and we do want this to be interactive, so I don't know, Rich, if somebody can have a, the mics just running back and forth. We'll be just, you look, that sounds like you're ahead of me. So in that same, same conference, uh, President Oaks said, our nation's history of racism is not a happy one, and we must do better. So again, we want this to be interactive. What was he talking about when he talked about our nation's history of racism? And, and their mics on, should be on both sides. That if you just raise your hand, they can take you the mic. Yeah. Slavery, segregation. Okay. All right. Slavery, segregation. And th those are the two things that we do want to talk about. I have up here on the board 1865. And 1865 was the day that slavery, slavery ended. And the one thing that's really, really struck me as we've been talking about that is that is not that long ago. That's 156 years ago. And so to put that in context, my grandmother, when I would talk to my grandmother, when she was a young girl talking to her grandmother, she could talk about slavery, because slavery existed then. And, and just think about that. So, so only 156 years ago, black men and women were treated as property. They weren't even treated as humans. And they could be bought and sold at auctions. And then you mentioned segregation. 1954 was 18, or, 1954 was the, the date of Brown versus the Board of Education and where uh, they ended the segregation. But up until that point, between 1865 and 1954, black men, women, and children had to eat in different restaurants, drink from different drinking fountains, swim in different swimming pools, and all, the, all these other go things. Go to different were, schools. Go to different schools that, that were intended you know, to keep them as, as inferior or second second-class citizens. So when we talk about our nation's history, we're talking about those sort of things. But what we don't talk about is what happened between 1865 and, and 1954. And that, that is that during that, that time period, there are over 4,000 documented cases of black men, women, and children being killed, not because they violated the law, but because they had violated or offended something that, that a white person thought was, was a rule. Or right, and done in an extrajudicial rule. way, right? So it wasn't a crime for a, a provable offense um, where there was a fair jury, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes it was just rounding people up and, and killing them. But we also, I mean, I'm half Irish too, right? And so we have a history of Irish need not apply or you know, fill in the blank. So we have this um, history as people of sometimes excluding right, um, others. And so we want to kind of make sure that as we grow as a Zion people, we're looking at all of you know, the people that we might be putting to the side. We have the Chinese Exclusion Act, too, um, that limited the number of Asian people who could come to the United States. So that we have a history that has a lot of division. And I've recently learned from um, members of the church who have Scandinavian relatives, that that um, sort of integration of people from Scandinavia and from the British Isles was a little bit um, difficult, you know, a little bit charged as they came together to, to, to live in, in Utah. 
Um, and so we have to remember that when we have differences, sometimes it kind of, um, we have a little bit of a bump up against each other. And we've got to figure out how to kind of rise to a higher and holier level as we um, interact with each other. Yeah. And, and I just want to talk about a couple of those, those stories. There was a woman in um, Alabama, 1933. Her name was Elizabeth Lawrence, a black woman. And she was a school teacher. And when she was walking home from school one day, um, some of the children were throwing rocks at her. And she got upset about it and, and actually scolded them. And then they, when they went home and told their families about that, then their, their families formed mobs and actually went to her home and ended up burning her home down and, and killing her because she had scolded someone for throwing rocks at her. And White children one, who were throwing rocks at her. Right. Yeah. And then one that, that most of you probably know about, does who, anybody recognize this, this picture? Who, who is this? Emmett Till, can somebody tell the story of Emmett Till? Anyone volunteer to tell the story? Okay, he's <laughs> gonna bring you a mic right there. Uh, this young man was uh, from Chicago when he went down to Alabama, and uh, that's his mom. Um, and she said, be kind and careful with white people, but and, and I, I don't even know if he he said anything too bad, but he, he made a comment to one of the store uh, owner's wife's wife, who was a young uh, woman, probably in her 20s, and um, that got back to the store owner, and, um, and I, I don't know what it was, if he touched her or if he, you know, whistled or made a, some kind of comment that young men might make of a pretty woman, and... Um, uh, the, the, the man and his friend or brother or something uh, caught up with Emmett. I think it was, how old? 14? 14. And uh, they beat him uh, pretty, pretty bad and, and shot him and threw him in the river. And uh, when they found the body, it was bloated and um, they were able to convince the jury that uh, it wasn't his body or had all sorts of excuses, a white jury found him not guilty. I think the judge even used the N-word for all of the black people who came to the trial. Um, that's the kind of prejudice of the, of the court. And uh, she took the body, his, his mom, back to, to Chicago and put it on display. And uh, it was truly an injustice that took place. Yeah. Thank you, that's a good... But they were exonerated and then later they actually sold their story and admitted that they had done it. Yeah. Yeah, so that, and, and again, that was 1955 in Alabama. So there, there are people in this room that were alive uh, when that happened. And a couple of, of comments that you made. Again, the, the people who did this were well known in the community. It was absolutely clear that they'd done it. When they, when they went to trial, they were tried to an all-white jury because black men and women were not to be allowed on the, the jury then. And they... In this, in this murder case, they deliberated for less than one hour before they found those, those men to be not guilty. And when, when one of the jurors was asked about that amount of deliberation, they said, well, we would have done it sooner, but we stopped to get a soda. And so you can see that, that was systematic racism, that they, they just, they, there was just no chance for, for justice there. And then you also commented that after they were acquitted, then they couldn't be tried again, and so they readily admitted that they did it. And then the really disturbing thing is they spent the rest of their lives in that community as respected citizens of, of that community. And then later on in the, in the, the life of the woman who had accused this 14-year-old this boy of flirting with her, then she ended up rec recanting her story. And you made an interesting comment in some of the earlier presentations about really the likelihood of a 14-year-old really flirting with a, even a 20-year-old, and how unlikely that seemed, especially since you have a 14-year-old boy. Yeah. That's not, and especially if you got one who was specifically told to really behave and watch his P's and Q's going down to the south. So that kind of just shows that there's a lot of um, situations where stories are made up to sort of justify certain things, and the woman did recant in the end, yeah. so. Yeah, so the, the, question, the question is, why is it important for us to understand that history? This is where we'd really like to have your, your comments. Why do you think it's important for us to, us to understand our country's history of, of racism? What good does it do us now? Thoughts about that? Yes. 
What, what do you mean? Honestly, there's a racist attitudes are can be can be so subtle, you know that. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, our, I remember when our elementary school uh, first was uh, integrated, and uh, one little girl the first year, the second year another girl and her brother, and I mean that's how slowly they, you know, in integrated the schools. I have two black grandchildren now also. Also, and um, you know, I'm I've become very much more aware. I had a good friend who felt it was her obligation to inform me that the uh, origin of of the Black Lives Matter uh, slogan was Marxist, right? And I wish I had been thinking faster when she said that. I would have asked her, "Well, does that mean Black Lives don't matter?" And you know, it, it's, we just don't realize, you know, I, I've come to, you know, I didn't think I was particularly racist. I mean, my mother wouldn't let us use the N word, and so that made me not racist. <laughs> but that, <laughs> you know, I, I've, at, at having these two black grandchildren has, has caused me to think a little more clearly about how the subtleties of racism. That, that's a great comment. Other other comments? Why is it important for us to understand this, this history? Yes, go ahead. Well, I think I went to West High School in 19, and graduated in 1955. And there were some black students at West. And um, I was clueless about any segregation. I was clueless about their mistreatment. I said something unkind to one of them and there were a bunch of them going to beat me up. And I just apologized and it went away. But I was clueless about any kind of, and I was raised in Salt Lake City as a non-Mormon and got excluded and marginalized and judged because I was not a member of the church. And I was aware of that, but I wasn't aware of any racism because we just nobody talked about it yeah. there was nobody talked that there was even what was happening in 54 I was unaware of it yeah. and I was in high school they should have mentioned it I I, I was most of the time awake <laughs> <laughs> but not in math class right um, what's also interesting about this state, so this was the Brown versus Board of Ed, uh, which ended um, segregation in schools, but there are some counties, including Prince Edward County in Virginia, where they shut down the whole public school system rather than integrate. And so sometimes when we have these sort of seminal dates, it doesn't really refl reflect the reality on the ground. And so, you know, for five years in Prince Edward's County, they shut down the school system for everybody. I mean, funds were diverted and there were uh, academies um, for white students, but they were willing to shut down everything and have to go to this alternate system in order to not integrate. So sometimes there are these hidden things in history. And I always pick on attorneys for this. And so I'm going to go to Wade Budge. And he's going to read Clause 6. And these are the restrictive covenants from um, my home on, on Preston Street on the north side of the freeway. And they're outdated, but and they're illegal. And they're illegal, yes. And they were <laughs> declared un state. well. They were de they were declared unconstitutional. Um, un they were declared unconstitutional about 1947. And I'm sorry, I'm out of the picture, but um, and there are some in our neighborhoods. I've seen them. Yeah. yeah. And so this is from 1939. So 1939 to about 1947. Okay. And he's going to read Clause Six on occupancy. Ownership and occupancy. No race or nation nationality other than the Caucasian race shall use or occupy any building on any law except that this covenant shall not prevent the occupancy by domestic servants of a different race or nationality employed by owner or tenant. And these were all about in the 30s or 50s. Yeah, this was 39, yeah. And so, um, so tell me, what does that mean, Wade, about who could, could I have owned my house in 1939, 1940, 1941? Yeah. Could I? 
could I have owned it? Uh, yeah, someone could have tried to bring an action, whether the courts would have enforced it. I mean, fortunately, we weren't in the South, but yeah. Yeah. That's a horrible thing to have on title. So it was on, it was on the books, right? But how could I, how could I part, live or uh, exist in that? Yes. So just to be clear, it's saying that you couldn't. I couldn't. I mean, you might have been able to like sneak it. He's, that's what he's saying. He's but saying but maybe I could have, but legally. And someone could have enforced an action against me removing me from that property, right? But how could I legally have existed on that property according to these, rec these restrictive covenants? Oh, but oh, well, I'm gonna pick on you anyway, because I know you. <laughs> how, how you have yeah, yes, how could I have been on that property in that time period legally? You would, you would have had to be a servant. I would have had to be a servant, exactly. And so even though that's another example of while this was declared unconstitutional, right, there's still practices that kind of linger beyond what the laws say, right? Their attitudes and actions that continue beyond what is legal. And so that's kind of what we're dealing with. And that's kind of the things that we're trying to talk about and bring to light, especially in the gospel context. Yeah, so as I've, as I've studied this, and, and similar to the sister that talked about having two black, black grandchildren, what's helpful for me is that, that it helps you to be able to see some of the issues that we're facing today from the lens of people, if, if I were to ask some of you about your family history in the 1865 time period, you could probably tell me stories about your ancestors. And, and for black men, women, and children, that's their family history. Their family history is slavery and having relatives that, that were part of the 4,000 that, that were killed. And so it, it helps you to understand that when someone argues about whether do black lives really matter, that's their family history. So that's perspective, there's perspective of it. And that's what's helped me. And, and I, had, I was completely unaware. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the challenges we have today is people who don't have uh, black members of their family, they don't think this stuff happens, and it happens. Like my, like my little guy says, Mom, it happens all the time. And then this is just an example um, of how the lingering effects may happen. Um, so a friend of mine, um, a friend of a friend, was living in the Highland Park area, so not too far from here. And a family had grown up in her house that she was getting ready to sell. And the family wanted to come back for a little reunion before, you know, just to celebrate their memories of the house. And the woman um, wrote to the current owner. Um, she's, she sent a nice note. We'd like to, um, here, let me go back a little bit. So they were thanking her, they, um, the current owner. Um, thank them for lo losing, using the house. They love the updates. And then this woman actually wrote, we'd like to remind you that in the original covenant of this house, it says that no person of color shall be um, able to own this house. So we will hope you will continue to abide by that, right? And so this is kind of the lingering thing, right? Prevented by law, but still this attitude. And so this woman who was a lawyer too, she said, on a, um, she sent a nice text back that she was grateful we had evolved um, beyond blatant, blatantly racist housing covenants, and the Supreme Court had upheld the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which rendered these horrific remnants of history entirely unenforceable. So, um, so here there was somebody standing up, you know, to this situation. And so, so somebody's mentioned we. It's not likely that that many people would would write the post-it notes with with the N written on them. But what we want to talk about now is implicit bias. So maybe not, not intentionally doing things that could be considered racist, but unintentionally doing it. So and we know that's ahead. kind of a charged term. And so we want to take the charge out of some of these terms and just say that we all have, well, first of all, what is implicit bias? Who wants to take a stab at that? We might have to start picking on youth. <laughs> that's what we do in our stake. Anybody want to take a try at implicit racism or implicit bias and what that means? I'm going to pick on Greg Pop because <laughs> I know him too. Well, I'm just taking oh, a guess, that. but um, I think it's it can be handed. These attitudes can be handed down through generation, and you might not think you're you have these biases, but you do, and that's just a guess. That's a good guess. That that's that's really what implicit bias is: is that you have you have feelings about someone's capabilities or characteristics based on their race, pe people that you don't even know, so. I gotta tell you about mine. I'm confessing some of mine, or the way I grew up, okay? I grew up in New York City. I had no idea where Idaho was, let alone St. Anthony, Idaho. We kind of joke that we're the odd couple 
So, anybody have anybody seen this? You're nodding your head, President Tingey and born Sister Ting. No, oh, you're born in New York. Oh, good. So, tell me about this cover. This is from the New Yorker magazine. It's really famous. It's from the '70s. And tell us what you see on this cover. Yeah, no, it's it's, uh, it's from Ninth Avenue to the Hudson River. And it's like the world is New York, and then and then there's this stuff out there that's kind of undefinable. Can any, anything west of the west of the Hudson? Oh yeah, there's Chicago. There's a mountain or two here and there. Uh, it does say Utah. It does know. say Utah. But <laughs> doesn't say San Anthony, Idaho though. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> It doesn't even, right. But, but the world is New York. Right. And so I really grew up thinking like New York was the center of the world. And we talk when we, you know, when there are elections, we talk about flyover country. That was kind of my mindset, that New York is where it's all happening. Anybody who doesn't live in New York really wants to live there and for whatever reason is being kept from living in New York, right? If I can make it there, I can make it anywhere, right? And so it wasn't until I was probably 17-ish and started um, traveling out of the tri-state area in you know, Massachusetts, plus Massachusetts, that I kind of saw, wow, there are some really great places to live outside of the tri-state area in Massachusetts, right? So I had to overcome my implicit bias about everywhere else in New York, I mean, everywhere else in the United States, right? There was California, there was kind of New York, there was DC, you went to Disney World in Florida, and that's about it, right? So we all have them. You know, judgments that we um, judgments that we have about people and places. And actually, my mom is probably a great Sam. Do you want to tell us about this story? Just with my mom when I moved out here. You got to raise your voice. So Alice has talked about. So. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, when, I mean, she was really skeptical about a lot of things, including <laughs> the church and all this other stuff. But when we finally explained to her we were moving from D.C. back to Salt Lake, she said what airlines fly to Salt Lake? <laughs> Can you get medical care in Salt Lake? Well, it was good medical care. <laughs> she was, said medical care. No, it was care. good medical yeah. care. That's the point of contention between yeah. us. But, you know, my mother's incredibly well-educated and very well-read, but still she had these biases about, you know, Utah. Okay. Yeah, so when we talk about implicit bias, as, as a trial lawyer, sometimes you, you all think when we're trying to pick a jury, we want to pick somebody that doesn't have bias. And what we're actually trying to do is make sure that we get people on the jury that are biased in, in our favor. And so, um, and we all have, have biases. Let me just share one, one story with you. It's actually a, a case that uh, Bishop Madsen mentioned, that I had a case where there was a death on the Jordan River. And I went to, to kind of check and see if there had been any, any improvements in, in this, this area. And so I was just kind of lost in my thoughts. I was actually thinking about one of these sort of, sort of presentations, and I came to a place where the Jordan River Trail goes under the, under the freeway. And so there's, there's kind of a long tunnel. As I walk into the tunnel, um, you know, I'm just lost in my thoughts, and then I realize there's somebody coming towards me from the other, other side of the tunnel. Didn't bother me at all. And then as he got closer, I realized he was black. And immediately my sensors went off and I became more concerned for my safety. And I'm a man that has two black children. So I, I was very embarrassed about it and immediately recognized it. And, um, but that made me think a lot about what, what about my background and experience made me more, being more concerned for my safety when I realized that that, that man was black. So, so thoughts about that. What, what makes us have these, these notions on, on things like that? have a question um, based on that. Like, as an attorney, have you prosecuted more people of color for, you know what I mean? Like, is there things that have happened in your, cause that's what I, I don't know. I don't know, but I, I always wonder, well, is it because you've had experience that has built that bias up? I don't know. So that, that's a, a very good question. Um, I was born in a small, small town in Idaho, and what it made me, me realize is I had no experience with, with anyone that was black until I went to college to play baseball. And when I thought about that, when I grew up, uh, somehow I was, I was taught that, that black men and women were um, more likely to commit crimes, that they were more dangerous, that, that black people weren't as smart as white people. But that's why you don't see black quarterbacks in the NFL or black, black coaches. And sadly, I was also taught that um, in church even, that the, being black was the mark of Cain. 
that black people weren't as valiant in the pre-existence as, as white people. Um, and we now know these things aren't, aren't true. And I don't remember anybody sitting me down and telling me that, but those are the, the beliefs I had that were just absolutely untrue, but, but I assumed that they, were, that they were true. And I think in terms of experience, statistically we're like this much of the population. Like really what is your experience, you know, with somebody who's a criminal of any kind, let alone somebody who's a person of color who might be committing yeah. crimes. I mean, it's like this big, right? And I think what's interesting too, though, is that we had done a presentation up in Kaysville, and this woman um, was talking about, and she had moved from back east, so she had experience, like in, um, was it Baltimore or someplace like that, but she had come back, and she saw these two kids on beach cruisers, and they looked like pretty nice new beach cruisers. And she... Two black kids. Two black kids, right. So the two black kids that were on beach cruisers, and she immediately thought, like, I wonder if they stole those bikes. And then you tell the rest of the story. Yeah. So she, she, she sees these two black teenagers riding new bikes, and her immediate thought is, I wonder if they stole those bikes. Maybe I need to call the police. And then immediately she thought, wow, I, I can't believe I did that. And, and the lesson of that story is she went home and talked to her children and told her children that, that this is what happened to me today to make sure that she educated them so that they didn't have those, those same sort of beliefs. Right. And then here's another flaw of mine that I'm gonna just put right out there for everybody to see. Um, who grew up playing with little Fisher-Price little people? Okay, and when we were growing up, right, they were the chokeable kind, right? So they were not, not uh, child-friendly, right? And um, so I loved the camper, I think, because I lived in New York, right? I thought that was just great, and they had the garage and the farm and all that kind of stuff. But I, um, and I grew up with a dad who didn't drive. We lived right in Manhattan. So you could hop on the bus, you could hop on the subway, you could take a car, you know, cab. Um, and so even with that experience of never seeing my dad drive, guess who I put in the car or the camper? Who was the driver in those things? The dad, yeah. So tell me, why do you think I put the dad in the driver's seat all of the time, even though I never, ever saw my dad drive? And for a long time, excuse me for a second, we didn't even have a car, right? We just, we just did our New York thing. We didn't even have a car. But my mom had the license from when she was growing up in, in Queens. <laughs> she doesn't want that mic. I know, she doesn't, but she, it'll, it'll be good for you. Um, probably because it's like a more masculine trait for like the dads to be driving. Okay, so you typically see dads driving. Okay, what else? Who's driving cabs in New York mostly? Men. Men, right, okay, so men are mostly driving cabs, especially back then. Okay, where else might I see that? Um, I'm just thinking about the media. I'm just going back, I'm still thinking about the black person in the tunnel and being worried. The media is like way more, if there are gangs in a show, like most likely they're people of color. And same thing, I mean, I don't know, in shows. So we, there are things like, in, in the media and yeah. things that we see and yeah. maybe some experiences that, I mean, I'm looking at cab drivers, but how many men and women are driving in New York broadly? You know, I mean, so there are things that are reinforcing some of these ideas without us being aware is kind of what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, and, and uh, um, the, the one thing that I think uh, we're appreciative of the church doing a number of years ago with, with the essays on race and the, the priesthood is that it's, it's absolutely clear that the church has disavowed these notions that, that being black is the mark of Cain or that, that a black person is not as valued in the pre-existence. And, and Does everybody know about the Gospel Topics essays? You can get them on your app, right? Yep. And if you don't, go, go check that out now. You know, I mean, or later, tonight. Not right while we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the one. And, and can implicit bias... Go ahead. Yes, do you have a comment? Sorry, I was just going to say, so uh, my sister decided to adopt children in her 30s because she didn't think she would be getting married and she wanted to um, adopt children of color or children of color yes and um, so she has two black children um, she lives in the Highland Park area um, her daughter is going to Highland I don't think she's there now but I know a lot of people don't think that this happens even with adults or children but my nephew is 12 and he looks like he's 10. So he just looks like a little kid. He's adorable. He's, you know, he likes to wear his jazz uniform everywhere. He was followed around at Target and the lady at Target that was following around, he went to his mom and he said, this lady's following me. And it was an older lady. 
probably like me. So he was following her, she was following him around and she told the people at the desk that the reason she was doing is that she wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to steal anything. So my sister had to have the talk with her son again. And I know you guys know what I'm talking about. People with black children, especially with black young men um, who are their children, have to have talks with them and say, you need to be very careful, you can't do this. And she said, we can no longer go to Target and wear a coat inside. We'll have to take it off when we're outside and you need to be with me at all times when we're inside. My, do my niece um, at her junior high school or middle school, I, as they call it now, um, they, were not a, they were sent to the office for wearing do-rags. Now, I know most of you, the kids probably know what do-rags are. Adults may or may not. Um, do-rags are not just worn to make kids feel more powerful or to make them feel like they're part of a gang. Do-rags are to cover their heads when they're going, especially when they're going through transitions. Um, a lot of kids of, of, that are black girls, um, their hair has a hard time growing out. It breaks. And that's how my niece is. She can never get it very much longer than just off, off of her head. And um, so she's constantly going through transformations with extensions and things like that. And in between those times when you're going through it, because it takes hours and hours, you don't have much hair on your head and it's embarrassing for them. So they want to wear these do-rags to cover their head and feel better about themselves. And they were told they could not do that and uh, that they were no longer allowed to do it. And any children that were wearing something like that were sent to the office and were getting in trouble and having to call their parents about it. It, it was really... Um, a very sad commentary on what's going on because I belong to that school district and I teach in that school district and I was horrified that this was happen, happening. I do want to just say really quick, I was in Las Vegas, we used to live down there and we were down, I was down by the baseball field one day, um, the Deseret Industries was down there and I was leaving from there and I met a, a wide street and coming across the street was a black man and I very surreptitiously reached down and locked my door and I immediately was horrified of myself thinking why would I do that? Would I have done it if he was white? Well maybe so in, especially in that particular area I was in but I the reason I did it immediately is because I perceived that there might be a problem. I did tell my sister and I said and she said to me she's the one with the two black kids she said, Trezan, I've raised these two black children, and I still have some of those things enter my mind at times. I think one of the most important things is for all of us to realize, and I hate to say it, but we are prejudiced for the reasons that you have, have shown, because it's, it's been through our own history and things like that, and I thought, Boy, I was raised by liberal parents so that I'm not prejudiced. But when someone said to me, well, how would you feel if your children married a black person? And I think that was the test for me. I thought, well, I wouldn't be as thrilled as I should have been. But what I love is that the younger generation now seem to be adjusting better than we older generation people are because there are so many more mixed marriages. And my wish is that in 75 years, we are also intermarried, that we're all just one color, you know? <laughs> and I think if we live long enough, that will happen, because I know people who've adopted black children too and have to fight the struggles, but maybe with the kind of things that you are doing, maybe we can realize we are prejudiced. And I think in that realization, we will see the pendulum swing the other way. Sometimes I'm in groups of people where I'm embarrassed to be white. You know, I just feel so apologetic. And I noticed like Smithsonian Magazine, they're featuring, featuring all black writers, historians, artists, but it's time that they are acknowledged. And if there's a surfeit of noticing wonderful black people throughout history, it's okay. We can sit back and let that happen and take a back seat and realize 
that we have created this and we have to kind of atone for it now. Well, one thing we want to say, like this isn't finger wagging, this isn't like, oh, you know, this is how we're all coming up short. We're all doing things well and we're doing things well that we can build on. And sometimes we make mistakes. And that's why we're, repent we're asked to repent daily, right? We can all do a little bit better, be a little bit better every day. And I think the other thing is, is that um, there's only one who is perfect, right? So there's no reason why we can't examine ourselves in a variety of ways to say, what can I do a little bit better? What am I doing well? What can I improve on? What brings me closer to the Savior? What brings me closer to being a Zion person myself and creating Zion here, right? And so pick, marry whoever you want to marry. You know, if you have the same interests, marry whoever that is, right? But we can all view each other literally as brothers and sisters, right? And that's what's really most important. And when I think, I did a talk in our, um, in our stake about um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right? And so we have Paul talking to the Mediterranean world. He's talking to the people of Corinth, the saints in Corinth, and he is saying over and over again in a variety of ways, because that's the famous set of scriptures on the body of Christ, right? You know, it's all the different pieces. He's talking about um, diversity and unity, right? It's not we all have to be the same. It's we have diversity and unity. We can all be from, we could be from, you know, uh, countries in Africa, we can be from Europe, we can be, you know, from Asia at that time, right? That, that's the intersection of the, those three continents, right, in this Mediterranean world. We've got people with different um, professions, people with different languages, different um, uh, practices and traditions and faiths and languages, right? And he's not saying, give it all up, right? What he's saying is that we can come together and be one in Christ, right? We can follow the Savior and his teachings, and that's what I, you know, energizes me about this work is that we can celebrate all of our differences and we can still come together and be disciples of Jesus Christ. All right, so we have um, a few more minutes left. The, the thing that, yes, go ahead. I have a comment, another comment here. I went to the primary program today um, where my two eights and nine-year-old black children performed. And as I was sitting there, I was just touched by the spirit and reached over to my son and said, I'm sure glad you adopted those two young men. And this is helping all of us move forward, but we've all got a long way to go, but it's okay, we're moving. That's kind of the point of mortality, isn't it, right? That's what we're doing on every level. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. I think the, the reality is that we all have these implicit biases. I have these implicit biases. I feel like I'm having a struggle every day the, between that kid that grew up in Idaho thinking all these things and now a more educated father of black children. But we all have these biases and I think the important thing is we recognize that we have these biases and that we talk about it and that we make sure that our children don't, don't have the same biases, that they're, they're not uninformed. So. One more story before we end, but first I want to get back to this question. So have you, have you been thinking about this? Who falls into this category of people that are excluded, marginalized, judged, overlooked, abused, and discounted? Thoughts about that? That, that is the perfect answer, as we all do. So it doesn't matter whether someone's sitting alone at the at the, in, at the lunch table in school it, because they're sitting alone because of race, religion, gender, Handicap. Anything. Right. Yeah, disability. We, we all are in that category at some times, and those are the people that the Savior focused on, and those are the people that we need to focus on um, and, and be kind to those people. Look out for and be kind to those, to those people. That's, exact, that's exactly our history that, yep. that we came out of. Uh, we should know the best, right? And be able to lead. And that's one thing I wanted to bring up too, is that our, our history tells us that we were persecuted, right? And so therefore, we need to be particularly sensitive. And we were actually, well, I won't get into that. That's a whole nother hour, but we won't do that to you guys on a Sunday night. But just the idea that we can be empathetic, right? To people who might be going through a similar experience. And that one of the things that the prophet said, he didn't say just don't have biases, right? He said lead out. 
right? Lead out. That's really an action phrase, right? And when I was um, taking the discussions with the missionaries in New York, one of the things that resonated with me was the invitation to exercise faith. It wasn't just to have faith, right? We as a people, we have faith and we do. We exercise it. And that's what President Nelson was saying is don't just, don't, just don't not be prejudice, lead out. And so one of our invitations, we're gonna have another invitation for you, is think about how you can lead out. Lead yourself, lead your family, but lead others. And so think about that for a minute. So the one, the one final story is my youngest child, who's now 16, is a bull rider, of all things. And we don't know how that happened because we're city people. But, He's a city person. I right. had no idea that existed, right? Well, I do have cowboy boots on. But, um, so we were at the, the PBR finals down in Las Vegas about, about a year ago. And if you don't know what that is, that's like the Super Bowl of bull riding. So all the best bull riders in the world are down there. And it's, it's an event where they have four or five rodeos every night. And so I took him down there. And between the rodeos one time, we went to this uh, gift shop that was in the arena where you can buy hats and belts and, and that sort of thing. And he went over, and because he was going to have to use his own money, he started going through this ritual of looking at this hat. And it was the hat of his, one of his favorite bullfighters, a man named Coney Webster. And so he, would, he looked at the hat, he would pick it up, he would look at the price tag, he'd put it on his head, and then he'd put it back down. And then he would do that same thing again and again. And so I noticed, while I was standing there watching him, I noticed that there was this older gentleman that was also watching him go through this ritual. And then the store clerk was watching the older gentleman and my son go through the, this ritual. So, and so keep, keep in mind this sister's story just from a minute ago, right? right. That's what's going through my head, right? right. He, he's being watched because they think he's going to steal this hat. And so after, after a while, he went through that ritual a few times. He decided, I guess, that that hat was too expensive. And so he put it down and went over to another section of this gift shop. And so I watched this older white gentleman. And he went over and he picked up that hat. He took it to the clerk, he paid for it, and then he walked over and gave it to my son. And he said, always be proud of who you are, and I love you. The store clerk took a picture of that man with my son and sent that picture to Cody Webster. And then she sent me a picture. I want to be that guy. President Nelson wants you to be that guy. I have no doubt in my mind that while he was watching my son go through that ritual, he was thinking about how divided our nation is at this time over race issues. And I also think he recognized that most rodeos that little black cowboy goes to, he's the only black kid there. And that's caused him some challenges, and that's right. And it made an incredible difference to, to him. On the way home, I asked him, I said, Isaac, what was your favorite part of the rodeo? And I thought for sure he was going to say when his favorite bull, bull rider got the highest score in PBR history and repeated as the world champion. But he said, when that guy gave me that hat, for sure. So that, that's, that's leading out. And let's face it, if I had seen that guy coming from New York City, I would have been nervous. <laughs> right? He's a Marine. He's got a bolo tie, like I would have been nervous, but this is leading out. This is catching stones, and we'll talk about that in just a second. We're going to wrap up soon. Yeah, go ahead. You can finish. Oh, I was going to say, so and, um, Elder Renland in a talk recently talked about being stone catchers, and he was actually quoting um, Brian Stevenson, who does work with the Equal Justice Initiative and wrote the book Just Mercy that was turned into a movie. And the whole point of this stone catcher story is that it's not... Like, one, you shouldn't throw stones, right? I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer, right? But everybody here is, we're good people, right? And the question is, if we're not going to throw stones, are we going to be bystanders? Are we just going to watch when other people throw stones? Who was in that classroom when someone wrote all those post-it notes um, for his son? Who said, no, we don't do that? But more importantly, who's the, who's the stone catcher, right? So we don't want to be a bystander and watch the stones, but we want to catch those stones and we want to lead out in abandoning at, attitudes and actions. And so part of our invitation is how can you do that? Or how are you already doing that? Because we don't say, like, we've come and we're going to solve your problem and da-da-da. We're all working on this together. 
And so our invitation is just to see what you're doing well, what you can do better, and how we can't recreate this PBR situation. I don't know if you'll ever find me in a bull riding competition, <laughs> right? And when I go past a farm, my reference point is the circus, right? Oh, it smells like the circus, because that's what I know from growing up. So we can't recreate all these exact stories, but what stories are you living where you can be a leader, where you can be a stone catcher? Can we say if we're on a basketball team and someone's using the N-word, hey, we don't do that on this team. Maybe we could do that. It doesn't have to be a big fuss and all that kind of stuff, but we could just send the message, this is not who we are, this is not how we do things here. Okay. So th thank you for having us. Oh, the, I guess the other invitation, yes, to, to, especially for the youth. There are so many times where we talk to the youth about, think about situations and what you're going to do before they happen, right? Because so much of us, so much of this work is we're unskilled. Someone says something crazy or offensive, even in families, right? And like you've got the one relative that says crazy things and then the rest of you are just supposed to kind of cope and deal with it and pretend it never happened, right? <laughs> Maybe that's just my family. Um, but so... If a child goes to, a, one of our youth goes to a, a party and there are things that are going on that shouldn't be going on or that we don't want our kids to participate, what do we do? What do we teach them? Sister Please. Pop. <laughs> yeah, call, right? We have a plan ahead of time so we know how to react, right? So that we're skilled when the opportunity kind of arrives and we can make that decision and not get caught up. And so one of the other invitations we have is, can you think about how you might stand up? when something happens. How can you be that leader or how can you be that stone catcher? Because it takes practice, it takes a lot of courage. And, but once we get used to it, once we've planned that out ahead of time, we're gonna be more comfortable doing it. Thank you. Say the things the name just Yeah, out. amen. <laughs> Rick and Deidre, thank you so much for your, for your wonderful uh, message tonight. Um, you know, we, we specifically had this fireside because we are also, we want to obey the prophet. We want to follow the prophet in this. We want to lead out. Um, and and we, we want to let the stake know that this is important. Um, we especially wanted to encourage conversations in the home that are based on the principles of the gospel that address these issues. You know, we, we chose the song, Love One Another, for a reason. Um, so I just want to share a few thoughts. We, so please have, have conversations in the home about this. What's helpful about tonight is we, we need to talk about these things, right? We need to, we need to talk about them uh, and get comfortable talking about them so that we can improve the world around us and, and help everyone belong. Um, I, I want to read a, a quote here from um, Elder Christofferson's talk this last conference that, that really, uh, really struck me. Because I want to kind of paint a picture of the future. Here's what Elder Christopherson said. He said, how blessed we are to see the day that Zion, and this Zion has been used, that word has been used many times tonight, that Zion is being established simultaneously on every continent and in our own neighborhoods. As the prophet Joseph Smith said, the people of God in every age have looked forward with joyful anticipation to this day, right? this day that we're in. And we are, we are, it says we are the favored people that God has made a choice of to bring about the Latter-day glory. In saying that, I don't think he's saying that we're better than other people. I think he's saying we've got a responsibility, right? We've got a responsibility to help create Zion. Having been given this privilege, we cannot permit any racism, tribal prejudice, or other divisions to exist in the, the Latter-day Church of Christ. The Lord commands us, oops, be one. Here, sorry, I'm going to get this so I can read it. There we go. Be one. And if ye are not one, you know the rest. What does he say? You're not mine. You're not mine. That's right. That's the Lord speaking. We should be diligent in rooting prejudice and discrimination out of the church, out of our homes, and most of all, out of our hearts. As, the as our church population grows ever more diverse, our welcome must grow ever more spontaneous and warm. We need one another. I love that. 
we need one another. I just want to share, I know we're, we're running a little bit late, but I just want to share a couple quick examples. Uh, I'm wearing a poppy today. This is a special tradition that we developed while living in London. Um, and uh, we were in the Hyde Park Ward. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel that our stake is, is, is a bit of Zion. And I felt that way too in London. Um, we were in the Hyde Park Ward. We had 56 nations from around the world represented in that ward. And I can't remember exactly who it was. I was sitting next to one of the general authorities. I think it was Elder Kieran on the, on the stand. And, and uh, he leaned over and he said, Brother Tingy, do you want to see what the celestial kingdom looks like? And he pointed to this war. 56 nations, every single type of nationality, race, everything. All one family right there. That was Zion also. Isn't it interesting that he said that? You want to see what the celestial kingdom will look like? Think of the population of the world throughout time, right? It is people of all races, all kinds, everywhere. That's the future. That's the future. That's, that, is, that is, you know, who we are as, as a family of God. So I, I just wanted to bring that perspective in as, as we can we do all that we can to help everyone belong feel that they belong in the kingdom of God, we will be following the Savior Jesus Christ because that's exactly who he is and what he does. I testify that this is his church and kingdom. And, uh, and he loves everyone. He does. He died for everyone. And I testify of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather here tonight and to listen and to learn about our privilege and how to treat others with love and respect. And we pray that we can collectively do better and become more like our Savior and lead on. And please bless anybody who are sick or ill or need extra blessings that they can receive them and that we can all travel home safely. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.